Mm, not us. What do you think? Okay. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our online <clears throat> uh, guests, and thank you for joining us this morning. We have a large number of people who have registered for this uh, discussion, and we have people joining all along. So we'll uh, allow them to join as we go ahead. This morning, we're dealing with the launch of the CDE report on South Africa's needs crisis. We have many young people or many people in South Africa who are not in employment, education, or training. My name is Brian Figaji. I'm a board member of CDE. We have a large number of people who are joining us for this Zoom discussion, and I'd like to welcome them all. Uh, and we have, interestingly, uh, a number of people from the US, from the United Kingdom, from Austria, Morocco, China, France, Nigeria, Canada, Ghana, Netherlands, and the Czech Republic. So welcome to all of you. It's, it's an international event this morning. There are more than 9 million unemployed young people in South Africa. And this indeed is a very serious crisis. And I hope that this report and our discussion will contribute to us finding an urgent solution. And the word, the emphasis is on urgent. I would like to ask you to listen very carefully to the words economic growth, scale, and urgency. Because these form the essential building blocks for a solution that we need to find in this country. The program this morning, we're going to have a presentation from uh, Anne Bernstein, who's the director for CDE, and Professor Stefan Schirmer, who did a lot of this research. Uh, and we're going to allow them 30 minutes to do the presentation. And then we're going to have 20 minutes of interaction. I would like to invite, because we have about eight journalists uh, on the call, and I'd like to invite the journalists to indicate by putting up their hands if they have any questions. And I'd like to give them the first opportunity during question time to ask the questions. And then for the other participants, I'd like to ask you to please record your questions in the chat room, and we will then extract them from the chat room and I'll direct them to, to, uh, to Anne to deal with uh, as a response. And so without further ado, I'd like to invite Anne and Stefan to launch into the program. Anne? Thank you, Brian. Can the host enable me to share my screen, please? And I will get onto the slides. Okay. Can everyone see the slides? Brian? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Before I get into the substance of this report, I should say that we're very grateful to Standard Bank's Tatua Community Foundation that funded this work um, with CDE and are our sponsors, but obviously not responsible for our findings or our recommendations. So why are we failing to connect young people to work? And what is the nature of our needs crisis? There are 20 million South Africans who are 15 to 34 years old. Almost half of these are not in school, not in any kind of training, and not in employment. I think you'll all agree this is mass exclusion at an almost unimaginable scale. Nearly three in every five young job seekers cannot find work. Now, our ever-expanding youth unemployment crisis is something that CDE has been dealing with for a long time. 
We've drawn attention to this for many years now. Here are just a few of our publications on this topic. We've consistently called for fundamental solutions at scale. Now, some of you might think you've heard it all before and CDE starting to sound like a broken record. But today we have a new CDE report that incorporates new research, some new insights into who these people are and what they're trying to do and how our society is responding. And we have expanded recommendations for action. Now, all of this today takes place with a new sense of urgency. While the implications of July's attempted insurrection are still unclear, the opportunistic looting that we saw clearly reflects young people's rising frustrations, desperation, and disregard for the law. In our view, this surely requires a bold and urgent response if we are not to witness these terrible scenes again, and perhaps even worse. I think it is fair to say that South Africa today is no country for young people. CDE agrees with the new Minister of Finance that we cannot condemn young people to a cycle of dependence, dependence on grants, or the basic or a proposed basic income grant or any other kind of grant. We have to provide them with a future. South Africa should focus far more attention on how to include people rather than how to compensate them for their exclusion. I will now turn to Dr. Stefan Schirmer, who will deal with our research findings. And then I will conclude with the implications of what we are saying and our recommendations. Stefan, over to you. Thank you, Anne. Um, so the report we are releasing today is the outcome of a major CDE investigation into the needs crisis, which we started even before the pandemic broke out. We know that there's 9.1 million young people who are in the status of needs, not in employment, education, or training. What we try to do is to unpack who these people are, what their challenges are, and what is being done and what should be done to deal with this crisis. In order to do that, we first of all commissioned research from the best experts in South Africa, as well as some international perspectives on this. We consulted with all the leading ex experts and organizations who are working with young people and are trying to do something about the situation. And we undertook field work in two unemployment hotspots. One was the township of Alexandra and the other was a municipal area in Pumalanga known as Bushbuck Ridge. Now, if we look at who the needs are and we start breaking it down to some extent, first of all, if we look at the education levels of the young people in this situation, we find that first of all, those with any kind of post matric qualification are relatively few in number uh, in relation to the huge number that there are. Only 8% are put into that category, although that still adds up to you know, a very large 750,000 young people. Um, that, you know, it takes them much longer to find a job than it should really. But in relation to other people who don't have a post matric qualification, they're much more likely to find a job and therefore you know, significantly better off than, than, than the people below them. Those who've only got a matric, constitute about 3.7 million, uh, which is 40% of the total, they face a very tough environment, they find it extremely difficult to get a job. But the worst off are those who didn't get a matric at all, either because
because they failed or because they dropped out of school before they got there. They make up the majority, 52%, and constitute 4.7 million young people. They are excluded from almost all training opportunities and often can't even apply for some of the most basic forms of employment because there's often a requirement that you must have a matric even to apply. Many blame themselves for this and suffer from low self-esteem um, as they struggle to find a way out of this. Another important distinction is along gender lines. Women um, make up about three-fifths of the needs who aren't even in the lab labor market, you know, aren't even look, able to look for a job. And even though women are, on the whole, more qualified than men, women find it much more difficult to get out of need status than men do. So there's something going on here, you know, it's largely to do with childcare demands that are preventing women from doing some of the things that men are able to do. And that's a situation we believe should be dealt with. Turning to our case studies, these two places where we spent some time and interviewed a lot of young people. The first thing that struck us when talking to young people is that they largely remain positive despite the huge challenges that they face. And a lot of them are actively looking for a way out of their situations. Many have spent short spells in employment and some have tried to start their own little businesses, but those often fail. Another interesting phenomenon that we discovered in both these places is the existence of you know, a significant number of youth centers who um, are trying to help young people to deal with their situations. They provide them with a space to talk about their problems. They crucially provide them with access to the internet and often some kind of training, usually sort of basic computer skills. But unfortunately, most of these centers can't demonstrate that they're really helping these young people to, to get out of their need situation, to get into jobs. Um, and one sort of surprising finding that we had in, especially in Alexandra, which is right in the heart of Joburg in many ways, surrounded by you know, the, the economic heartland of the country, is that they're very inward focused. They're focusing on what's going on in the township and what opportunities there are in the township. And they don't really know much about what's going on outside of the township where the real opportunities actually are. If you look at Bushbuck Ridge, um, again, the youth centers are struggling to really make a difference. And that's not really surprising because it's an incredibly difficult place to be a young person. In that area, only 5% of young people are in, in any kind of employment. Um, and there's very few economic opportunities within and even around those places. Some young people that we spoke to, you know, were able to leave the area and maybe go to Nelspreet and some even to Johannesburg to try and find jobs there and, and, and go to interviews and things like that. But after two or three weeks, they often run out of money or they have to go home for some other reason and they find themselves back where they started, not in employment, education or training. Another interesting thing that we found though in Bushbuck Ridge was a, a, an incredibly effective training center right in the heart of the area. And what that center was doing was working with the one sector that does produce um, that does produce some economic opportunities in the area, and that's the sort of big game lodges in the place. So working with the owners of those lodges, they were training young people in the skills that those people running the lodges were looking for. And by working with the local businesses in that way, they were effectively linking them to real job opportunities. And uh, you know that just suggested to us that surely this must be an important way to connect young people to work, getting them into job relevant skills programs um, so that they become eligible for employment opportunities that they might not currently be eligible for. But if we want to achieve something at scale in this area, we need to look at our skills system. Now, 
how if we investigate our post-school training system, we're struck by how, how expensive and inefficient it is overall. Looking at TVETs, the situation is that a 20, 2018 study found that CETAs achieved a throughput rate of just 9%. 9% of the young people who started, made it through to the end and graduated. Another study found that almost half of young people who embarked on TVET studies in 2010 were unemployed five years later. CETAs, which are a, a, a part of the training system to upskill those people who are already in, in employment, have been largely dysfunctional for a very long time. And uh, again, incredibly costly. The one calculation shows that in the past five years, they've managed to lose 13 billion um, because people dropped out of the short courses that, that, they, that they offer, 13 billion. Um, and, and the problem with that essentially is that business is enmeshed in the system of CETAs, uh, forced to contribute in many ways to the, the, the skills levy, and they get very little in return. So until that changes, we believe, we can't really expect business to do a whole lot more in terms of providing the, 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 the kind of job linked skills that young people want. And that's an absolutely crucial area of concern because that's what we need. Because if we look at the global lessons on how to make a training system work effectively. Oops. Sorry, I, I forgot about that. We can characterize our skill system as a hugely expensive recycling system. It takes young people out of the labor market for a while, then puts them back in, but not in a way that would really make them much, much more employable than, than, and have the kinds of skills that they should have. Sorry, to go back to the global lessons, um, what we found from examining the best systems in the world, the ones that really deliver, is that training can connect young people to work at a large scale if business is involved in the design and the implementation of, of the training programs. This is absolutely essential to ensure that the skills that are being put, put, delivered um, are relevant to the employer's needs and are trusted by the employers. Those are two crucial aspects. Um, it's also very important to combine classroom training with on-the-job experience and to ensure that the whole thing is demand-driven, i.e. you're producing skills in parts of the economy where there's growth and a demand for, 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 for labor uh, and, and young people with those kinds of skills. And that also means, especially in the South African context, that you have to have an expanding economy. The economy is not growing and there's no new jobs being created. Then you're training people for, you know, to, in a way that will increase their frustration rather than chances of getting jobs. In all of these respects, there's massive room for improvement in South Africa. So it's not like um, nobody's doing anything about the situation. The, the president has declared youth unemployment as a crucial, or the fight against youth unemployment, as a crucial priority for his government. And in early uh, 2020, he set up the Presidential Youth Employment Initiative. Progress on this is, is unclear and, and seems to be quite slow. But a big focus has been on um, creating publicly funded employment opportunities in schools, um, an initiative called the Basic Education Employment Initiative, which has created so far around 300,000 four month uh, opportunities for, for young people to be school assistants. It started on the 1st of December. Um, and there's a second wave coming, um, uh, the call for that went out recently. Another important initiative is the SA Youth Platform, which was designed by Harambi, um, and 
aims to link young people to employers and training providers on a digital platform. Another interesting and, and possibly promising uh, initiative that's being supported by the PYEI is the basic package of support, which is a program designed by academics at UJ and UCT, and is trying to support and provide better information to young people to help them connect to employment and to training opportunities, you know, which is an area that we identify as quite problematic in, 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 a, in, in some of our case study areas. Uh, this is still in the very early stages of piloting. Um, so we'll be watching that with interest. One has to mention Arambi as, as making an important contribution in this area. They are the most important privately supported initiative in this, in this field. Uh, they're doing many, many things to try and ameliorate the situation for young people. Um, and they've had the achievement of putting 240,000 young people into employment or work opportunities since they started around 2011. Another important development is the extent to which a lot of projects are now being designed, not a lot, but increasing number, um, are being designed as experiments um, rather than just as once off attempts to help a few people. Um, what they're trying to do is to use you know, a project to find out whether something can work, how to do it in the best way possible, and, whether, and then to use that to take it to scale. So this could have an important impact on um, changing the situation, you know, fundamentally changing the situation. Um, but that can only work if um, it's accompanied by rigorous and independent M&E uh, monitoring and evaluation programs. Those have to be part of, the, part of the experiments, otherwise they can't do their job. So we have to remember, though, that these initiatives on their own cannot impact sufficiently on the huge numbers that constitute this crisis. Based on our research and our discussions with, with, with people in the field, CDEs come up with some specific recommendations that we think can help to change the situation, to make a structural difference. Um, one area which we think is important to tackle is the area of matric rewrites. We know that there's 250,000 um, young people in any given year who are, are writing the trick outside of the school system, outside of the school system. Many of the most, most of those are, are rewriting the trick in some form. And very few of them pass. I think it's something like 40,000 um, out, of, out of the 250,000. This is, you know, an important thing to, to, to help those people who don't have matric, but they need much better support if they're going to have any chance of making it through the second time around. CDE thinks that there's a lot of private colleges who offer that kind of support and, and do it fairly well. And we would like to think about how to initiate an experiment to see whether we can, A, expand the offerings that these uh, colleges provide, and B, make them more accessible and, and or affordable for more young people who are desperately trying to get them a trick. Another important area to uh, tackle is the area of childcare to help those women who are being kept out of the, out of the workforce because they you know, have a disproportional um, burden to bear in terms of, 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 of raising the children. And here we think we should be exploring, and there are a lot of sort of proposals on this, um, the extension of early childhood development centers, especially into the areas where you know, the challenges for women and, and the needs crisis are the largest. And then lastly, in terms of training partnerships, these are still the exception rather than the rule partnerships between business and TVETs or other kinds of training providers. Um, but there's an increasing number of these and some have been quite successful. We need to understand much better what makes them successful, how to ensure that this happens much more often, um, engage business on what they would need to expand their commitments in this area 
uh, and then implement experiments and even more importantly reforms that, that would bring business into this field much more extensively all of these things we believe could be important structural interventions that can make a difference to the situation it can start changing the dynamics that are keeping so many young people out of employment but government has to do much more if anything is going to happen government has to do much more and they have to do the kinds of things that will do away with the things that are stopping uh, the investment rate from rising and from employers hiring many more young people. Things that we want to highlight um, in this very, very important area is, first of all, find ways to lower the cost of employing young people. The cost of employing a young person at the moment is too high relative to the productivity of that person, which is not incentivizing businesses to employ young people. We should experiment with different labor regimes. We should try and find out whether tweaking with our current labor laws will actually lead to a huge in increase in, in, in employment. There's ways to do that. Um, we do need public works, uh, especially in those areas where there's very little prospect of growth and huge levels of unemployment. Um, but if we're going to do public works, then we need to do it along the lines in which it was originally envisaged i.e. a valuable work experience and connected in some way to, to training so that the people who come out of that experience are actually more employable than when they went in. Mm -hmm. um, if that doesn't happen, then it's not really worth spending the money on it. And crucially, small businesses, if they're growing, um, can be an important source for employing more and more young people. And we need to get rid of the, the barriers, the many, many barriers that are preventing small businesses from flourishing uh, in, in the current situation. But I need to emphasize again that without decisive government action, SA's need crisis will continue. And now I want to hand back to Anne. Thanks, Stefan. Um, let me emphasize a few key takeaways and the implications of what we're saying. With over 9 million young people not employed and not in education or any kind of training, it's our view that government and business need to shift their priorities. South Africa has to move away from ad hoc interventions into failing systems and what Paul Collier of Oxford has called boutique projects. And many municipalities, provincial governments and companies are engaged in this kind of thing. These projects make a good photograph, but they cannot deliver anything that is truly transformational. Now, of course, most of these projects help people. They help 50 people, they help 100 people, they help 5,000 people. But you have to appreciate that in many respects, they are politically irrelevant. They do not change the trajectory of the country's development and the nature of this crisis. They don't really help millions and millions of people who are excluded. And that's why the numbers keep going up and up. So governments focus on projects, on special initiatives, on summits, on talk shops, on growing the public sector wage bill is the wrong priority. Worse than that, all these activities divert resources and leadership from absolutely essential reforms. And these reforms are the only way to start tackling the scale of South Africa's youth crisis. It's almost as though South Africa will do anything, anything at all to avoid the fundamental 
yes, I know hard changes that have to be made. The truth is that the best, most sustainable, most scalable projects are called firms. And South Africa needs many, many new firms and the environment to incentivize existing firms to expand. Jobs are the first step to individual empowerment. And that's not how many people are thinking about this today. There are no shortcuts, much as we would like them. And government, it seems to us, must stop pretending that if we avoid the big policy issues, the difficult reforms, we can somehow make a difference and turn this crisis around. Business too should stop going along with government in the diversion of projects and initiatives and rather put far more energy into pushing as loudly and as effectively as possible for the reforms we absolutely have to make. We should bear in mind that a faster growing economy that is more labor intensive will pull young people into work. Companies wanting to expand if conditions are right will find young people in unexpected places and new workers and they will train them. And in this way, South Africa's enormous challenges will lessen as the pace of growth and demand for labor multiplies. Now, in order to get to that situation, courage and bold action is needed. And it's needed in three areas of activity. We need to stop talking about growth and we need to actually take the decisions that will get us to growth. You can't achieve growth if you put a weak state that is corrupt at the heart of our recovery strategy, which is where the country is currently at. We have to drive the reforms that Operation Bull and Lela is prioritizing and much more. And some of those things are not necessarily the right reforms. We're a country that's desperately short of skills, and yet we may waste money and time in developing a critical skills list of who we will let into the country. As somebody said the other day, we should rather be asking, who do we really not want in this country who has skills and who's an entrepreneur? So growth is absolutely fundamental if you are serious about dealing with the youth crisis. And that is going to require a different approach from the state to how to free up markets and ask entrepreneurs and investors to risk their money. But growth alone is not going to be sufficient. We need job rich growth. We need labor intensive growth. In January 2020, the president was speaking to organized business and he said that nobody had told him what changes were required to the labor market or to the labor laws. CDE immediately wrote two op-eds, two articles in response to the president, spelling out very carefully calibrated labor market reforms that we and many other people in the country would argue will help make us a more labor intensive economy. We put far more money into subsidizing capital than we do into supporting jobs. CDE has also proposed in the context of our political realities, a reform policy zone, a special economic zone, different from all of South Africa's other SEZs, but one that is designed to deal with this issue. How can we attract low skill manufacturing to this country? And we're suggesting and have spelled out in quite some detail 
how this might be done as an experiment at Kucha in, at Kucha in Nelson Mandela Bay. Need some changes, some policy changes, but they carefully chosen to not threaten the rights of organized labor and the trade union. So the second big bucket of bold action and reform has to be how we make this a more labor intensive economy. And the third one is it surely is way past time that South Africa really improve its education system and its skills training system. These are expensive items on the national budget and they're all low performance. And here again, CDE is working very hard on a set of proposals on how we can reform basic education so that we stop competing with the worst performers in the world, but we actually move up one, two or three gears to start competing at least in the middle ranks with Kenya and other countries. And if you look at our skills training system, as Stefan has indicated, the evidence is clear. We have to rethink how to make our vocational education and training much more effective. We have to deal with the root cause of this and then how business and companies can get much more involved in training. And all of this has to be done with a real sense of urgency. We don't have a lot of time and we have to start doing this with seriousness and intent. Now sequencing matters. About a decade ago, I was talking to the head of education from, from Ghana and they had had significant improvements in basic education and skills. And she said, there's a very important lesson. We've told young people to work hard. We've asked them to sacrifice, to go on skills training courses and to really make a big effort. And very of, many of them do this. But if we cannot provide the jobs in the economy for which these young people are qualified at very basic levels, you create a situation of frustration. So we want to stress Dashed expectations are dangerous, and especially in the South African context. A society with ever-growing numbers of unemployed and excluded young people with no stake in our society or prospects for the future, such a society cannot expect to remain peaceful, and democratic. And I want to end then with something that Paul Roman, Nobel Prize winner, said to us in South Africa at the end of 2020. If you can't solve the problem of getting the majority of young people into work, it may not matter what other problems you solve. So let me end there. We're very willing to take questions from the media and any other participants in this, in this discussion. Um, I'll hand over to Brian. Thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you, uh, Anne, and thank you, Stefan, for a very good uh, presentation. As I had indicated in the beginning, I would like to um, offer the media people, whom I know are here, an opportunity to ask their questions directly. If they would like to just raise their hand, I'll call on them and, uh, and, and they can put their questions. For the rest of the participants, if there are 19 questions already in the, in the chat box and I will use those to um, <clears throat> direct them to, uh, to Anne and the team. So is there anybody from the journalism fraternity who would like to ask a question? Uh, Anne, I see your hand is up. Is that a mistake? No, no, no. 
Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> since there doesn't appear to be at the moment, uh, or at least I don't see a hand up here. Um, Brian, um, Rihanna de Longa's hand is up. We're just trying to unmute her. So if you want to go to another question in the meantime. Okay, so I can't see a hand up. Right, okay, I see two hands up now. Zwani and the Lange. So, uh, Zwani, would you like to uh, raise your question? We just have a technical issue with allowing them to speak. So Simon is just um, allowing us to allow them to speak right now. So if you want to go to one of the uh, typed questions in the meantime. So there, uh, there are a few uh, questions in the chat box. <clears throat> um, and, and Monica's question, I'm going to ask about, uh, uh, pose about three questions. So Monica wants to know whether the unemployed TEVID grads, is that a general uh, statement or are there uh, more in the particular program that are unemployed. So are you able to make the differentiation of unemployed between programs? And then Crystal wanted uh, us to um, <clears throat> indicate whether the stats that you refer to are in the report. And I could have answered that, but I'll leave that to you to answer. Um, Andrew was concerned about the acronyms, but David helped him out and responded to some of the uh, acronyms and wanted to know where and how he could access the report. Uh, and then <clears throat> David made a comment about EPWP jobs. And he says they are really not effective and he uses the example of uh, he had a, a gardener and uh, when EPW came out, the gardener went to EPW and after two years lost EPW and when he came back to the gardening, he had lost all his clients. So should we rethink EPW, EPWP, which is a, a comment that he made. So I'll, I'll pause there, Anne, with those four sort of comments and see whether you can just take them all together in a, in a response. Well, let me deal with some of those and then ask Stefan if he wants to come in. Um, all the statistics that we've used are in a report that we're releasing today. There is a long report, there's an executive summary, and there will be some op-eds coming. So please look at our website and you will get the report with many more statistics as well as the ones we've used today. Um, the expanded public works program is a complicated and large program. Um, I don't know about the, the experience of David's gardener, but we are saying that in a situation like this, a country does need some form of public works program, but we are calling for this to be managed in a much more effective way and to link the public works jobs, which are short-term jobs. They are short-term support to, to people with nothing, um, that we're calling for this to be linked much more effectively to training. We did originally, when this was all being set up, suggest that the government needed to bring in private sector help, but this was not um, acknowledged then. So we do provide people with this employment for the short term and some very basic money I should point out less money, we suspect, than the people who were given jobs from December 2020, but that's yet to be proven. So it looks like there's some, we're setting up two different systems of public employment, which is extremely complicated. Stefan, if you want to handle the question about the unemployed graduates from, or diplomates from TVET colleges. Yes, thanks, sir. Um, so the, the number I cited comes from a study which followed a number of, um, and it, it is in our report, followed a number of, of, of young people through the system, um, and, and, you know, that's where the 9% comes from. Um, you know, so 
I'm not sure, you know, exactly what the overall completion rate is for the whole system. Um, I do know that there is quite a lot of variety and there have been some improvements. So there's been a like quite a strong push to, to get business more involved. Um, and that has had some positive results and, and led to, you know, what you'd expect with better training, more job relevant training, but it's still way too small. You know, it's, it's a tiny fraction of TVETs and the general trend is still in, you know, way in the wrong direction. Uh, a, a total disconnect in many ways between the needs of business and the kind of training that's provided. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's not, you know, do I want to paint the whole thing with the broad brush? They're all the same, you know, there's definitely better ones than others. Uh, but as a system, as a whole, it leaves, you know, much, much room for improvement. Comment on the access, where can people, how can people access the report? On the CDE website, they should go to the CDE website. Okay, good, thank you. Rihanna de Lange, are you able to speak now? I see you unmuted, but uh, I can't hear you. Toledo, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Um, Good morning, I'm Tuleto Zwane from uh, the City Press. Um, I wanted to find out your thoughts about uh, the basic income grant and if this was considered one of the possible short-term solutions when the report was put together. Good, thank you. Thank you very much, Tuleto. And? Yes, well, thanks for the question, Tuleto. Um, the basic thing, we're interested in jobs and we support the Minister of Finance who is saying that a job is a far better situation for young people than a grant. And that would be our view. Now, exactly where South Africa ends up in terms of additional financial support to young people or to everyone in the country is not yet clear. And we're waiting to see what the Treasury would be promoting. But in general, we would not be in favor of a basic income grant. We're in favor of the cheapest alternative there is, which is policy reform. South Africa has no more money. We have a burgeoning fiscal crisis. And actually, policy reform would be a lot better alternative than anything else we can think of. So we didn't consider the basic income grant in this study. And in broad terms, we are not in favor of expanding what is already one of the most redistributive systems in the developing world. We just cannot afford it. Far better to change the laws and open up our economy for much more inclusion rather than compensate people for their exclusion. Oh, thank you, Anne. Uh, Rihanna de Lange, can you speak yet? I see you've uh, dropped your hand and you and you muted. I'll come back to you if you still have a question. And then can I just deal with the other? There are some very useful comments from Robin Whitaker and, uh, and a few other people and, and advice and suggestions. And we'll follow those up uh, after this. David has made a comment as well about the concern about the burnout of the 50 plus age group. But that's not really the group that we're talking about this morning. Alistair raises a question about, um, he says, expansion needs growth, as you did refer to, Anne. And, and he talks about all the ANC policies and BE and cadre deployment that, all sit in, that are all impediments. And, and, and he suggests that CDE reports are good, but probably go straight into the Bernard Latuli house. And I thought you could perhaps just comment on that because that last comment is, is actually not true. CDE is having, is having some impact. And then um, just three other quick comments. Uh, Makumi suggests that early childhood development is an important aspect. And that's probably the root cause of a lot of the problems. Uh, and I think it's a, probably is a, is a, is a valid uh, comment. 
Paul wants to know whether we have any data or information or feedback on the efficiency, impact, and relevance of the Yes for Youth program. I'll yes. stop there. Thanks, Brian. And I can see Rihanna's question in the, she's written it out, so I will respond to that. Um, what happens to CDE reports? Well, with the help of the media, we get as much publicity as we can. We distribute them to over 15,000 decision makers in the country. And we talk to government. We talk to metro governments. We talk to provincial government. We talk to national government departments. We talk to parliament. So we do our utmost best to be heard. Uh, you might say that we haven't been successful when it comes to labor market reform or a different approach to getting South Africa to grow. Uh, but we are certainly listened to and debated with in very senior government circles. For example, our proposal on a special economic zone, a reform, a policy reform zone is being heard in the Department of Trade and Industry. And we have a, a growing relationship with the special economic zone unit in that department. And we have a, a good relationship into the national treasury and into key parts of the presidency. So CDE is being heard, but like everyone else in the country, we're hoping for a much, lot more action on the, the hard reforms that have to be made. Let me respond to Rihanna, who, who says that with the launch of the ANC manifesto last night, the president referred to many successes with jobs for young people. She asks, why do we not see it in the numbers? And does government realize and acknowledge the needs crisis? Let me deal with this in different parts. There are no doubt that there are projects and activities all over the country to help young people. Some of these in my view, in CDE's view, are not delivering results. For example, this idea that you can train young, unemployed, unskilled people who generally come from communities and homes where nobody works, that these very same young people can become entrepreneurs. All our research shows that this is a recipe for failure, except for one or two extraordinary exceptions. So we think those are projects we should not be putting a lot of effort into. They don't deliver results. They set up people for failure. On the other hand, there are projects, provincial governments, companies and others who have successful small projects. They help 100 people. They might help 50 people. They might even help 10,000 people. And that's great for the people involved. But when you are talking about a situation of close to 12 million unemployed, whatever age, and 9.1 million young people, small projects are not the answer. The president called a summit, a job summit. They added up 275 projects. And nine months later, nothing had happened. Projects are not the answer. We have to change the structure of our economy so it's more labor intensive. We have to incentivize employers to hire more young people. It has to do with wages, and it has to do with ease of hiring and firing, and it has to do, very importantly, with economic growth. If we're not growing as an economy, which we haven't done for five years, employers are not employing. They doing everything they can to hang on by their fingertips and keep their businesses alive. They can't hire more people, they're retrenching people or trying their very best not to. So economic growth is the foundation for everything. And so we don't see any impact in the numbers from all these talk, talk, talk shops, all the small projects, 
And that's why I'm stressing, South Africa has to grasp the nettle. We have to enact reforms and we have to look at the reality of how you implement everything that needs to happen, whether it's infrastructure or cheaper data or critical skills or a whole lot of other things, we have a state that is struggling to implement. So we need new people in our top government positions who actually want to help the country grow and have the skills to do it. We need new people in our cabinet who are competent, who are not corrupt. And we need to start getting results in terms of growth. So we have to change the story about South Africa and provide a more compelling story to get people to risk their money in this economy. And that's the key foundation for getting more jobs together with labor market reform, not radical, carefully calibrated, and then getting more people with skills. So I think that's why we're not seeing any response in the numbers. The last question is about the YES initiative. This is a well-meaning initiative by business. It's extraordinarily expensive. And quite frankly, it's the kind of project activity I don't think helps South Africa deal with the scale of the unemployment challenge. So maybe some 20,000 people have been helped, but this is not where business should be putting its effort and resources. I would far rather they were putting it into much more effective advocacy campaigns and communication strategies for the reforms that we're all talking about. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me then uh, move on to, to three additional questions. Um, Dilly Naido uh, asked the question, I think you've, you've responded to part of it already. After the report, what now? Government needs to actually be uh, responsible for many of the actions that are required. How do we advance this? That's the one question. James comments by saying, does higher education bear responsibility in any way for guiding our young people into, uh, into proper jobs or disciplines? Confidence uh, asks uh, the question, suggests that the new um, general certificate in education at grade nine, which is being developed by DBE at the moment, uh, is going to be important and aimed at school leavers what are the three critical things that you would advise the minister to include in that program uh, that would be addressing some of the issues that we raised this morning? And then Janet um, asks whether we are aware of what specific kind of skills and jobs would be relevant in South Africa today. And then Louise offers some good advice about uh, and, and points us to a second chance pro metric program in response to some of the comments that, uh, that Stefan made. I'll pause there for the moment. Great, thanks, Brian. That's the three questions became five, but I'm going to deal with question number one and four and Stefan should think about two and three. So somebody's asked what now? once we've released the report, I think the first thing is we're, we're saying that there's a difference between being unemployed and being a neat. And we hope this report will clarify that to decision makers around the country. So in part, it's information sharing, and in part, it's, it's getting across what has to be done in order to deal with this ever deepening national crisis. So we will be looking at how we can influence how the government is spending its money and prioritizing with respect to youth unemployment, but also how 
large companies and foundations are thinking about where to put their resources and their effort in, in trying to deal with this, this massive crisis. Uh, and we do that in a number of different ways. So the, I want to deal with this very important question, thank you for asking it, about what skills we think South Africa needs, what skills are relevant for South Africa today, and what jobs. And I think the way to, to start thinking about this is to understand that in the modern economy in the 21st century, it's hard to predict in advance exactly what jobs businesses are going to need. We know people must be numerate. We know people must be literate. And frankly, South Africa is doing a very bad job on those basic skills. In terms of what other kinds of skills there are, there's a wide range of them. And if we were to get an expanding economy, we know that those demands will change. We know coding is important, but there are all sorts of skills. Five years ago, no one would have predicted the kinds of skills we use today. 10 years ago, nobody would have known that there was a job, I forget what it's called, an engineer who designs the algorithm to make sure that your website is top of the list when people go into Google and not somebody else's. So there are a wide range of new activities taking place all over the world, teleworking is expanding since the COVID pandemic. And I don't think that's predicting all of that is, is, is a fool's game. I don't think that's what the country should be doing. And that's why I'm opposed to the critical skills list. I think South Africa needs to have basic skills for the vast majority of people that equip them for the 21st century, reading, writing, and numeracy. If we start talking about the next level of skills, this is not something CDE is an expert in, but they're the skills that businesses are saying now and into the future they need. So I think we've got to think about dynamic economies very differently and how people find their niche is not so much dependent on the qualifications you have, but on a whole range of other things. And at very basic levels, we have to get people numerate. Um, so let me stop there and ask Stefan to quickly respond to the two other questions. Okay, so the other two, the first one was, does the DHET bear responsibility for the situation? Um, and I would say definitely. Um, but just, you know, I've been involved in quite a few discussions with DHET officials and others, you know, around some of the things that I've been talking about. And there is a recognition, you know, across the department to, to, to make things better, to bring business in, to, to have shorter courses, to make sure that the, the, the skills being delivered are, are, are job relevant. But the issue is implementation. You know, the, the, there's, there's not a willingness to fundamentally change. Um, there's tweaking here, there's tweaking there, there's movements in one direction and then it's, it's a movement back again. Um, so we just haven't seen any real change. Um, th there have been some improvements as I've said, but you know, we really need a much stronger commitment to implementing a different kind of system. Um, then on the grade nine leaving certificate, hey, Yes, this, this is an important issue that, that we are still thinking about. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a positive initiative probably, uh, but again, it's about how you do it. I mean, if it puts a focus on more vocational education, then that's gotta be a much more effective, different kind of vocational education. Um, and of course, all of this will be meaningless unless the economy is expanding and there's an, an expansion of demand for the kinds of jobs that these grade nine leavers could, could actually apply for. So, you know, it's a, it's a good idea, but again, it's the, the, the devil is in the details. Uh, thanks, uh, Stefan. And then uh, lastly, I think we'll end up with um, 
with these two uh, comments. There's a comment from Monica um, and from Robin, which talks about, well, asks whether we did investigate the potential of the gig economy in addressing the youth unemployment issue. And then Monique also suggests uh, there's a zero dropout campaign. And that's just a suggestion. She refers us to a website, and I'm sure that we can follow that up uh, afterwards. But perhaps just a, a last comment on the on the gig economy, uh, Anne. I'm going to hand that over to Stefan. Um, we did actually do a little bit of work on, you know, in, in terms of the mind led training programs that isn't. You know, I'm not sure if it is the gig economy exactly. Uh, the definition uh, isn't that clear to me. But uh, we, we, we did sort of do some work on looking at the potential to train people up to work on websites and do some very basic programs. It's almost like pre-programming. And there seems to be quite a like interesting initiative on that, which we, we thought was interesting. But, but that's about as far as we took it. Okay. All right. Uh, I think we've covered most of the comments and questions raised by people. Uh, there, there are a few thoughts uh, and comments made, which refers to the need for the ability to read for meaning, uh, the importance of early childhood development, uh, the whole structure of uh, the school system and the products from the school system. And the comment is that because of all the, because all those things are lacking, we are now uh, sitting in this particular situation. All of that is true, and all of that needs some work to be done. The real issue we're addressing today is 9.1 million needs. That's the issue. They are here, and we've got to do something with them. Otherwise we will have a volcano that starts to erupt. And that will not be good for South African society in any shape or form. And unless, and everybody knows it's urgent, and everybody knows we've got to do it at scale because of the size of the problem, but it seems often that ideology and practice get in the way of making the basic policy changes that will allow economic growth, because economic growth will be the engine that allows a whole lot of other things to happen. And so it is important that we as South African citizens uh, stop this, end this conversation uh, about what can and can't be do and stop tinkering on the, on the sidelines and actually tackle the fundamental change required for economic growth so that we can solve society's problems that help us all. So let me end by saying thank you to all of you for joining us this morning uh, and for raising the questions and for lots of the advice uh, that you gave us. And I hope that you will go to the, um, to the CDE website and access the report uh, and, um, and comment to us uh, on any matters that you may still have an interest in. Thank you, Stefan, for your contribution. And thank you, Anne, for uh, making all this happen. So thank you, everybody. And that's the end of our session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.